Let's talk about perception of progression. Every game relies very heavily on the player feeling like they can make progress, so in most games we put in ways of making progress. Pretty basic, right? Here's a linear narrative, have you seen the story yet? Here's some stats, have you gained some levels and gotten new gear yet? Here's some Pokemon, have you gathered all the Pokemon? Now these are all undeniably methods of making progress, and the player can make progress down through them as they play. But it turns out that's not actually what matters. What matters isn't whether the player can actually make progress. What matters is whether the player feels like they can make progress. And this is really critical to understand, because we often come up with these brilliant ways of making progress and then forget to tell the player why they're fun. Having an actual way of making progress, like say a linear narrative, works great if you communicate to the player that that exists and they can make progress in it. We want to play up how the player feels about every step they take down that progression. So let's talk about some ways of differentiating progression and clustering it so that players always feel like they are making progress and that they want to play the next step. Let's go back to Mega Man. Now in Mega Man, you can choose any of these eight outer bosses. The Dr. Wily, this is not there originally. It starts as Mega Man looking around as you pick a boss, right? But having eight bosses to pick is not very much fun. Eight is a huge number. That's like an MMORPG quest. Collect eight bear skins. Oh, great. That sounds fun, right? So how does Mega Man make it so that having eight bosses to pick from doesn't feel daunting and boring? Well, the first thing they do is they create personal preference differentiation. And differentiation is the big thing that Mega Man does throughout. So what am I talking about? Well, you're a kid between the ages of 8 and 15, and you sit down to play Mega Man, and you see this spread of bosses. Which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick your favorite, right? So Quick Man is probably up there, because they look cool. You're probably going to like one of these three, which one depends on your personal preferences. But you know who you're not going to pick? You're not going to pick the guy with a log on his head. You're not going to pick Bubble Man, not unless you're a herpetologist. So... By and large, this is a matter of arranging these eight bosses into favorites and then settling on your favorite. You are not picking the first of eight bosses. You are picking your favorite of eight bosses. This is incredibly important because it means that we are starting to eat away at that eight number without bringing it up. We sort of don't mention the fact that you're going to have to do this seven more times. We just let you pick your favorite boss. Pokemon's like that too. Which starter are you going to pick? Uh, so are most RPGs. Which starting class are you going to pick? Did we mention that you're going to get every other class as an NPC? No. Just pick your favorite class. So we pick Quick Man, and we go through Quick Man's stage, and we kill them off, and we come back to here, and we've got seven other bosses to pick from. This is where it gets dangerous, because the second of eight... That's brutal. That's like one of the weakest possible places to be. Oh, joy, we're almost 30% of the way through this game once we're done with this next step. How much fun will that be, right? we got to choose something like this. It feels like a tiny step. It feels minuscule. It does not feel fun to pick the second of eight anything. So how does Mega Man pull it off? Well, it's differentiation again, but... We do not pick our second favorite boss. No, things have been scrambled. The context is different, because when we killed Quick Man, we stole Quick Man's power. So at this stage, we're not only thinking, oh, I can't wait to try out this power and see what it does, so it doesn't matter what boss I pick because I'm going to try this power out, and that's going to be the cool part. We're also thinking, which of these bosses could Quick Man kill? Suddenly... The scales have changed. We no longer think that these three are cool, because these three, Quick Man probably couldn't have killed so easily. But you know, Quick Man could probably kill Bubble Man pretty quick. Probably Wood Man too. So suddenly, these two, which were at the bottom of the ranking before, are now at the top of the ranking. And we start to think to ourselves, which of these could Quick Man kick the ass of? And we choose, again, our favorite of seven in a new context. 
By changing the context and changing the differentiation, we start to make progress through the game. We start to change how we judge our options. And that means that we don't have to think of it as the second of eight bosses. We think of it as the boss that Quick Man could kick the ass of. And then after that, we think of it as the boss that Bubble Man could kick the ass of. And we go through and we start to mark off all these bosses, right? And we start to kill them all off. By the time we get along here, we're starting to think, okay, now making progress is the main point. I don't know whether Crash Man is someone that Flash Man could beat up, but I do know that Crash Man is the last boss. So now, just the mere fact that we are almost at the end of our options is the point. That's completionism, right? If there is 10 things you can collect, when you're at 9 of 10, there is an overwhelming urge to collect the 10th. The closer you get to the full set, the more important it is to finish that set. And then, of course, you kill off Crash Man, and Dr. Wily is revealed. Ba -ba -ba -bum, and you have to pick Do Dr. Wily next. Oh, look, it's super cool. A special ninth secret stage. Now, of course, if Dr. Wily had been on there from the beginning, and you just couldn't select him, um, it would have felt worse, because then you'd be taking on one of nine, two of nine, three of nine. And even when you finally did defeat Crash Man, Crash Man wouldn't be the last boss. Crash Man would be the second to last boss, which is much, much worse. So by keeping some of the options secret and holding off until much later to, to reveal them, we've made sure that we don't have an overwhelming number of options. This is some very basic techniques. We're using differentiation with changing context so that we always want to pick our favorite enemy, but our, what, what that means keeps changing. And we also hide some of these so that we keep the numbers low and then reveal secret final bosses and stuff later on. As we go through the game, our context keeps changing and updating, so our opinion of every boss changes, and then we get to the end and we're like, oh, cool, time for the final confrontation with Dr. Waiwi. So, this same setup works very well for basically all games. However, a lot of games have more than eight options, more than nine options. A lot of games have hundreds of options. Hmm. Let's talk about Pokemon for a second here. So, there are 948,272,413 Pokemon available, and you want to collect them all. Boy, that does not sound fun. I've collected one of two million Pokemon. I've collected two of two million Pokemon. I've collected three of two million Pokemon. Oh, no, you don't want that. You don't want the feeling like you're not making any progress because there's a million years to go. So what Pokemon does, and what all options like this do, uh, they use chunking. So chunking simply takes some of these options and puts them in their own context. And then some of these options get put into a different context, and then so on and so forth. So a good example of this is when you start the game and you're given your starter options, you aren't given the option of 12,000 starter Pokemon. You're given the option of three. Pick your favorite starter. And you do this with the understanding that this, this is a fairly special choice. You're not going to run into the other two starter Pokemon very soon. So this is something that you're going to be, you know, stuck with for a while. Then you go out into the tall grass and you find that there are, you know, four new Pokemon there. So yes, there are a million Pokemon for you to collect. But if you collect this Pokemon you will have collected 25% of all of the Pokemon in the wild grass. Oh, look, you ran into this guy over here, but you don't really like him, so you're going to ignore him. Uh, oh, look here. Now we've collected 66% of all of the Pokemon we care about in the wild grass. And so on, right? And oh, look over here. There's a forest. What sort of Pokemon are in the forest? Well, these five Pokemon are in the forest, one of which is left over from here, right? So we can start to chunk it up. We never feel like we are making tiny amounts of progress against an astronomical sum. Instead, we are given much smaller sets and we make you know progress against a smaller set. But one thing that a lot of indie devs fail to realize is this. 
You see, chunking relies very heavily on interrupting the player's brain. If the player goes straight from one chunk to the next chunk, then they merge those chunks together. And so now all of a sudden we've got eight or nine Pokemon rather than three and five or whatever, right? We've got to worry about the fact that those numbers start to add up. And as they add up, each additional capture counts as a smaller percentage of the total that we're trying to achieve. So what Pokemon and literally every other successful game of this sort do is when they chunk up their Pokemon, they put a big ass gap between the chunks. What happens here? The rest of the game. You've got your narrative, you've got your city exploration, you've got your side quest, you've got your caring for your Pokemon, you've got your leveling up and buying gear or whatever else, right? The key is that all of the stuff that happens in here takes long enough that you DRAM, you unload all of the loaded up data about how far you'd gotten. So, you know, you captured two of these Pokemon and then you come here and you sort of let that settle. You still remember that you captured two of those three Pokemon, but it's no longer your current progression. You're not doing that anymore. Then you come here and you meet a new Pokemon. You capture it. You have now captured 25% of the new Pokemon that are available. Instead of capturing the third of seven, you're capturing the first of four. And this is the big secret to chunking. This. You've got to interrupt the player's cognition. But if you're clever, you may have noticed something. This. This is all also chunked progression systems. And this is the beating heart of RPGs in general. They are several distinct progression systems that get interwoven. And they get interwoven with, a, uh, when, with enough play in them so that you can forget the progress that you made before on another line for long enough that when you go back to that line, it feels fresh. So, you know, a good example of this would be Persona, which is one of my more preferred RPG uh, setups, right? You play as a bunch of high schoolers for a little while. By the time you start to get a little tired of that progression, you feel like you've gotten through most of the chunk, you get dropped into a dungeon. That's got enough content in it to last you for a little while, and then you get back up here to another chunk, and then back down into the dungeon, and then you get brought up here to another chunk, and then you go over here to manage your, your demons, and then you go down into a new dungeon, and each of these is its own little carefully chosen chunk. So you keep flipping different lanes. This chunk in this lane, then this chunk in this lane, then that chunk in this lane, then th th you know, back and forth, back and forth. This allows for the player to reset their brain. Moreover, if each of these chunks has a soft edge, then you can allow the player to switch at their preferred moment rather than doing a forced hard switch. A good example of this is leveling, right? There's usually no absolute limit to how high level you can get in a given area, but there's a fall off. The leveling curve, we kind of call it the numbers go up curve, right? Yeah, look, your numbers are going up, hur, hur, so easy. But what it actually is, is numbers relative to other numbers. So if this is the difficulty of the dungeon you're in and you're leveling, well, leveling feels really good here-ish, right? because compared to the numbers in the dungeon, your numbers are going up. But past a certain point, you're dominating the enemies in this dungeon to the point where gaining more levels doesn't really do anything significant. And it takes longer and longer to gain levels. Those two things are related. We make it take longer to gain levels because we don't want you to keep gaining levels. There's no advantage to it. You're already going to start feeling bored because you're already too powerful for this area. So the spike in the amount of XP it takes to gain the next level is matched up with how worthless it is to gain the next level in this area. How far along this curve someone goes depends on who they are and what they're trying to do. Some players will level pretty much forever, and they're happy to just level. They just like seeing numbers go up. Other players do not like to do that. They'll get to, like, here, and then they'll immediately drop off and go to the next area. Having this soft limit 
allows the player to swap to another track of progression whenever they start to feel bored with their current track, and where they start to feel bored doesn't matter. Some players might feel bored near the start, some players might feel bored near the end, but the instant they start to falter, guess what, there's another track. We can see this with progressions in stories, like here's a linear narrative for your favorite RPG. So what actually happens here? Well, you might have noticed that there are a lot of side quests floating around in each of these areas. So the idea here is that you go and you do side quests for a while, and maybe you go out to another chunk of like, you know, doing battles or whatever. When you start to get tired of the side quest chunk, when you start to feel like the progression isn't worth making, this takes back over and you're like, oh, I do have a lot of story left to do. We'll go through it. But what if your story is too compelling? What if the player literally can't wait to see what's next and just decides to completely skip all their side quests? Well, that very rarely happens, unless they're reviewing the game. The reason it rarely happens is because of FOMO. Fear of missing out. This is usually used by abusive marketers to try and make sure that they can mine you for every penny. It's uh, really sleazy. But... It doesn't have to be sleazy, and this is a good example of how you can make it not sleazy. The idea is, obviously, when you go to the next part of this linear narrative, you're not going to be able to come back here in any meaningful sense. The side quests are not going to be here. The demon lord burned this town down. Obviously, you're not going to be killing four wolves for the mayor or whatever, right? So, because of that awareness, the awareness that this is a gate, and you can't go back once you pass through, that means that players will put a pause on their narrative and instead do side quests for a while, which means that you don't have to carefully measure out how strong each of these is. You don't have to carefully make sure that your narrative is weaker than your side quests, so people do your side quests. All you have to do is make sure that your gating is clear, and FOMO will take over and make sure that players experience the other tracks that you want them to experience. And in the process, that will give you enough time to reset what they think of your main storyline. This is something that I think a lot of players or uh, devs don't realize. Your main storyline is not a linear sequence because the player goes and does other shit all the time, right? But if you don't build your storyline to be able to survive that, then when the player does all these side quests and then comes back, they're going to be barely remembering any of it, right? Like, oh, the demon lord is attacking. Well, let me go do some side quests for a while. Oh, I guess that demon lord attack wasn't a big deal after all. What was his name? Chad or something? What you need to do is you need to build up your other chains when you're doing one of your, one of your chains. So if you've got four lines of progression, when you're doing one line of progression, you need to be pumping up one of the other lines of progression so that when this line is done, that line can take over classic example of that is the leveling up sequence. You know, you do a dungeon to level up for a while, and then you do the next sequence where you fight the boss. The leveling up here makes you strong enough to fight the boss. And moreover, all of the enemies you face and all of the sequences you see build up the boss. Are you doing side quests for the, for the town? Well, guess what? Those side quests are going to lead up to the fact that this boss is dangerous, either because they make you feel for this place and then the place is destroyed, or because they're all about how bad this boss is or whatever, right? These are different progression sequences, but one of their main roles is to build up the other progression sequences so that the player perceives them as being more interesting. The player must feel like they want to make progress. So, inside of any given chunk, we arrange it so the player feels like they're making progress. And we set it up so that when they're done with this chunk, the other lines of progression feel more important and they feel like they can make progress. At least that's my opinion. Let me know what you think.